and good evening, welcome. Um, this is a very special live edition of the New Mexico Humanities Council's program Starting Conversations, Water, Community and Creativity. I'm Bethany Tabor, I'm the host of this program. And this event is a culmination of our ongoing Starting Conversations program series around Asequia Aki. Um, I'd like to thank all of you again for tuning in um, and especially Sylvia and Miguel, thank you for being here tonight. And I'd also like to begin with an acknowledgement that the New Mexico Humanities Council operates from and is headquartered on the traditional land of the Pueblo people. And we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. And today we're very delighted to present this program in partnership with the Paseo Project in Taos to celebrate the launch of their publication, Asequia Aki, Water, Community and Creativity. The Paseo Project's mission is to transform art through community and community through art. In addition to collaborative community projects and a socially engaged artist in residence program, the Paseo Project hosts the annual Paseo Outdoor Art Festival in historic downtown Taos. Since 2014, artists from all over the world have brought projection, installation, and performance art to the streets of Taos for this free two-night event. And you can find out more at paseoproject.org, which will be linked in the chat. And Asequia Aki, the project, is an artistic and community-driven project, uh, which took place over the last few years and aims to give voice to the historic Asequias of Taos to illuminate the importance of this vital resource and cultural wellspring. Matt Thomas, who is the executive director of the Paseo Project, is, uh, has joined us on this call. I will let you, Matt, say a few words about Asequia Aki. Thanks. Thanks, Bethany. Thank you so much. And thank you to New Mexico Humanities uh, Council for hosting this series of starting conversations uh, for the, the launch. Oops, I'm multitasking here with, uh, <laughs> here with people coming in the room. Um, uh, thanks for hosting this series of starting conversations for the book launch for Asequia Key. So in the fall of 2017, the Paseo Project set out to address rural community design issues utilizing the creative tools of the contemporary artist. And so in collaboration with the Asequia Madre del Rio Pueblo, we developed our first booklet, which was the Asequia Key, the History and Preservation of the Asequia Madre del Rio Pueblo. This was a publication, publication that visualized the downtown area's disappearing Asequia networks. And the booklet documented existing and lost Asequias. It captured stories from local parcientes and provided resources on existing codes and guidelines and language around the centuries old public utility. And then in the final pages, we did this call to our local creatives. Like how can we educate, illuminate and celebrate our historic Asequias? Um, so for our annual festival in the fall of 2019, six New Mexican artists, and some of them are here with us today, so I'm really excited to have them um, a part of this, this call today as well. Um, they were invited to present their work to the community of Taos using a diversity of media, uh, presentation methods, and engagement activities. And this series of work revealed, really, for me, it was fascinating how intricately, intricately connected the Asequias um, have been and still are in our lives here in the high desert. So going beyond sophisticated water irrigation systems for local agriculture, the Asequias are embedded with traditions of weaving, storytelling, culture, and, and art. Um, so intertwined, in fact, that to lose our Asequias is to risk losing really the art history and culture that it supports. And so with this final publication, we're excited to feature 11 installations and performance pieces in addition to poetry, photography, and essays from Paseo artists um, from 2018 to the present. And this compilation reveals contemporary approaches on how we can share, educate, commemorate, preserve, and perhaps revolutionize these historical lifeways. And so I want to thank uh, Miguel and Silvia for joining us today, uh, the Lore Foundation for their continued support of Asequia Key, and to all the artists and creatives we worked with uh, for the past several years to help imagine a future um, for Asequias um, in our community. So, so thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, there is a digital version of the of the booklet, which I will send the link to now, um, and you can uh, flip through the pages of the entire publication. Um, there's also, uh, the Paseo Project has a SoundCloud uh, where you can listen to the writers uh, who have read aloud their contributions. Um, that's in the chat as well. And finally, 
Uh, I will also link to a couple um, starting conversations, pre-recorded panel discussions um, that we hosted, uh, that the Humanities Council hosted um, with a few of the contributing artists. So this first, uh, this first link is to our session on that was dealing with the theme of placemaking and placekeeping with four panelists. And this second session was um, on the topic of storytelling and poetry. Um, I encourage everybody to uh, give those a listen. Um, they were very insightful conversations. And I'm so glad to be culminating with this event tonight. So finally, we'll be speaking to Miguel Santisteban and Silvia Rodriguez, both of whom contributed work to the book in the form of essays, and in Miguel's case, a participatory artistic intervention at the Paseo Festival. Uh, I'll start by introducing each guest individually and allow some time for each of them to speak on their work and involvement in the project. And I'll ask a few questions, get the conversation started, and then after a little while, we'll open up the discussion to the audience. Um, you can feel free to drop comments and questions into the chat. Uh, Matt and I will work together to make sure your questions are addressed and that our speakers can respond. Um, so to kick us off, I'm delighted to introduce Sylvia Rodriguez. Sylvia is Professor Emerita of Anthropology and former director of the Ortiz Center for Intercultural Studies at UNM. Her research and publications have focused on inter-ethnic relations in the upper Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico, where over the past three decades, she has studied the cultural impact on ethnic relation of tourism, ritual, ethnic identity, and conflict over land and water. She works collaboratively with Asequia organizations and researchers on Asequia matters and the politics and anthropology of water. She is a commissioner on the Asequia de San Antonio in Valdez and a member of the Taos Valley Asequia Association Board of Directors. Her publications include journal articles and two prize-winning books, The Maratines Dance, Ritual Symbolism and Inter-Ethnic Relations in the Upper Rio Grande Valley, and Asequia, Water Sharing, Sanctity and Place. So Sylvia, I'll let you start off with talking about uh, your work and your essay in this in this book. Um, and what I'd like to uh, directly ask about first is your essay, Asequias and Monuments. You uh, mention and point out the lack of historical records around the genesis of the Asequias in Taos, how they were dug, by whom and when is obscured information. And historians have to put together an incomplete puzzle uh, to understand the history of each individual ditch. And this has an effect on how the community today uses the acequias and, and um, facilitates the resource sharing. And so it means that if there is a significant loss of information and knowledge, this could be detrimental to the resilience of the community living in the desert. Um, and so if we understand this moment in time to be the history for future generations, what needs to be put in place now to ensure that no knowledge is further lost? Well, I think simply the, maintenance, the maintaining irrigation and the integrity of the, of the acequias and their operation, they're under a, a whole variety of challenges and threats to their existence as are similar systems all over the world. Um, the fact that we don't know the history of the ditches is less a threat to their survival than the attrition uh, and the kinds of forces that conspire to eliminate them from our environment. And by that, I mean, not only our biological and ecological environment, but our social environment, which are all interwoven. Uh, so I think as uh, Esteban Arellano used to say, the, the first thing you have to do is to actually use your ditch and to irrigate it uh, and to maintain uh, maintain the ditch and follow the rules of the ditch. And this is becoming increasingly diff difficult for people to do um, for a whole host of reasons that are both internal and external. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or you wanna, I mean, I think, I think that it's, a, uh, it's a practical issue in many ways. Right, the, the, the disuse and continued, continued disuse will then equal um, a sort of like perceived, people will perceive them as being sort of obsolete because people aren't using them. And so they become, um, it, it's not a materially a part of the culture, if I understand it correctly. 
Right, their disuse, and that can be caused by any number of, of reasons. Uh, in the case of the town itself, the, the, the obliteration of the ditches, uh, mm -hmm. which was a gradual process beginning in, in the 60s. I mean, people maybe stopped using them, the town filled them in. Uh, there was a whole ethos that really militates against uh, wanting to use them. And the decline of agriculture, of course, is a, a long process that begins certainly after World War II, if not before that. It's been a gradual process. So, I mean, there's a whole range of factors. I mean, the economy, the difficulty of farming here in the first place, attrition, people getting old, people leaving, young people not having an economic foothold here or enough incentive to actually keep farming. At the same time, there's a tremendously important uh, resurgence of interest in acequias and organizing around acequias. Uh, the New Mexico Acequia Association, the Taos Valley Acequia Association, people like Miguel, uh, who have decided to, you know, come back and to farm and to do it in both traditional and innovative ways. I think there's an enormous uh, development of interest. It's almost as if the, as the acequias become increasingly threatened with extinction, they've never been more studied, celebrated, uh, and uh, understood than, I mean, it's, it's, it's more the case now than ever before. So it's as if, you know, as they are on the verge of extinction, more and more people are talking about them, certainly wanting to photograph uh, limpias, for example, that are going on now you know, students wanting to do papers on them, scholars coming from around the world to try to understand them, a, you know, a whole development of new scholarship, and also activism, uh, the organizing of Asakias, not only on the local level, but on sort of a, a regional level. All of these are important developments, the emergence of women in leadership uh, in uh, Asakia organizations. So these are two things that are happening simultaneously as, um, economic and political and cultural and social forces conspire to push them into extinction, uh, there's an increase in interest and commitment to them. Um, I think one of the greatest threats, of course, is climate change. Uh, for sure, the tipping point on any ASEC is when there's no water in the ditch. It's, um, it's an interesting tension that the, um, you point out the endangerment seems to equal an increased interest. Um, and so that seems like there's, uh, that's the, the balance that people are currently, it, 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 the tipping point, I don't know, that just seems like an interesting uh, tension between the two, between endangerment and then uh, a revitalized interest. Um, I, think the revi get that balance. I think the revitalization of interest is um, a manifestation of their resilience. Mm. The fact that there's a, uh, change going on, there's adaptation, there's innovation going on. And so I think a lot of these uh, developments of interest and engagement with the Asakias is actually a manifestation of their resilience. Um, that's really, uh, that's really nice. And I, and I want to get back to the metaphor that you make between, between Asakias and monuments, um, and especially considering, um, considering this, this sort of concept of endangerment and, and what it means to memorialize something and memorialize something that is not yet dead, but in danger of going extinct. Um, I wanna get back to that, but while we are talking about um, the subject of uh, blending old and new technologies and new innovations, I want to introduce Miguel Santistevan um, because that has so much uh, to bear on your work. Um, Miguel has bachelor's and master's degrees in biology and agriculture ecology and certification in permaculture and ziri design. He is an educator, seed saver, researchers, researcher of acequias and resilience, and radio producer of Que Vivan Las Acequias. He writes semi-regularly for the Green Fire Times and has given dozens of professional presentations on acequia agriculture and the search for sustainability in a climate change context. Miguel founded the nonprofit organization Agriculture Implementation, Research, and Education. You can find out more at growfarmers.org, which I will link in a second. Um, 
He's a founding member of the New Mexico Food and Seed Sovereignty Alliance and has coordinated several youth in agriculture programs. He works as a middle school math teacher and lives in Taos in his acequia irrigated farm with his wife and two daughters. Miguel, your essay, Acequia Apocalypse, and your larger project, um, you address the multicultural community and the diverse traditions that make Taos what it is today. And uh, in this piece of writing, you also talk about um, the influx of, peop of newcomers, people who are traveling here um, to, and settle here, people who are not from here. Um, and tourism, migration, relocation, all of these things have major effects on the resource ecology of a place. And you point out that, that with increased migration um, and tourism, there's a, a, an influx of new development or progress around the, the city of Taos brought by people who have not necessarily been raised here. Um, and at some point, the technologies and traditions from hundreds of years ago, like the acequias, will have to take precedence over newer innovations. But I want to know what you think about engineering solutions of today being used to augment the acequia system. Yeah, I don't know um, uh, exactly what you mean by engineering. I mean, in a practical sense, you know, we have modern compuertas. You know, we have... Uh, uh, different ways of managing the water, you know, using, um, you know, gates and wheels and these kinds of things. So that's helpful, especially when you start to see the, um, the changes that are taking place. And a lot of people that would have maintained the acequias in the past are now, you know, wage earners. So the mire, if there was a problem with the river that would blow out our press, our uh, diversion structure, in years past, you know, the Mayordomo would knock on your door and say, hey, I need a crew to go help me maintain the river and we got to go fix this whole thing. And, uh, and then, you know, that would get done through a community effort of, you know, um, uh, of collective labor. And uh, now, you know, we don't have that type of cultural or social fabric, you know, so we have big... Uh, big um, contracted designed structures, you know, like for example, a lot of people have criticized us because we get to a, a time in the year where we take the entire river and there's no water in the river. And people say, hey, you know, you shouldn't take all the water in the river. To that, I say, you know, this river's dry. When I was growing up here, you know, this river flowed year round. I used to go fishing in it, okay? Now there's so much development upstream, so many straws in the aquifer mm -hmm. and, and a bunch of illegal impoundments. We cannot believe how many illegal impoundments are up there. And, you know, and state laws against that, but guess what? It's up to us to litigate that. It's up to us to have the time and the energy and the money to go up there and prove that the law's on our side. So, you know, on the one hand, we have soil and water and state programs, USDA to help us build all these structures. And, and quite frankly, if we didn't have all that engineering, we might not be surviving. You know, uh, that said, like we just paid off our diversion dam, you know, it was, uh, I don't know, like an 80, 20 loan or something. We had to pay 20%. We had to pay a few hundred thousand dollars or something. And we started that project in the seventies and we paid it off like, what well, maybe six years ago. Now it needs to be redone. And, uh, you know, and if it was up to me, I would pull all that stuff out and I would say, let's go back the old way. But, you know, quite frankly, there's not enough people who can work that hard and for that long physically mm. and the same thing economically. I mean, me, yeah, I, you know, I love being a teacher. It's my job. Teaching is my passion. But I'm doing it because I got a mortgage and I got bills. You know, I founded a nonprofit and I tried. I tried to raise a family and have you know, uh, quality of life and pay bills. I went after the funding, you know, I tried that for what, 10 years, you know, and after year six, I started to realize it's not going to cut it. You know, I'm not going to get funded to the degree 
um i there's ju i just i don't know how to do it i you know maybe there was some uh cultural insensitivity or racism going on with the whole funding structure you know so i couldn't do it so i can't be on call for the Meyer domo you know the Meyer domo said hey i'm gonna run the water on wednesday when do you want it hey i can only take it saturday and sunday i gotta work you know so i'm not available just like everybody else so yeah these engineering solutions are great they've saved us a lot you know we're able to to control our water and manage our system more efficiently but uh at the end of the day it's people that make it happen people with shovels you know and uh and teamwork that's where it gets done and that's what i'm really concerned about you know as all these new people move in you know first of all a lot of them aren't used to working it's a it's a hard day of work out here you know the sun is hot you're gonna complain about how hot it is and how thirsty you are you might want to find a different job because you know there's a lot of a lot of work a lot of blood a lot of sweat and and it scares me you know i'm gonna be 50 years old you know this year and uh and i'm starting to feel it you know i'm starting to feel it in my shoulders my back you know it's a good thing i'm a modern kind of guy you know i do yoga and uh and the more yoga i do the better i feel so you know hopefully i can keep that balance until you know i can no longer do it but uh yeah, you know, what other engineering can they be? You know, when I started on this a whole Asequia thing, because I wasn't raised like this. I was raised in Albuquerque, and then I went to Los Alamos, and I came full circle home. When going to Los Alamos, I was like, there's something wrong with the world. If we got enough bombs to blow up the world seven times over, you know, that ain't right. So I went looking for solutions and the solution, I finally came around all this activism, all this. I said, you know what? All the problems in the world can be solved in a garden. Joseph Jenkins said that. And, uh, and so then I came back over here and I started studying the Asequias. And this is my grandfather's house, a house my grandfather built, you know, arguably uh, my Santi Estevans were the first uh, founders of the Merced de Don Fernando de Taos. And so when I first started to learn my own history, which I wasn't grown into, you know, uh, over here, you know, it was a mortal sin to uh, pave an asequia, to concrete line it, to pipe it. But that was me speaking as a college boy, right? Now I've managed this system. I've been the Meyer Domo, I've been the president, I've been on the TVAA, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of parciantes of managers and you know and i hate to say this but in the future if i gotta manage this system the way that it is i might advocate for piping it i might mm -hmm. and if anybody any managers out there commissionals are out there and there's they're piping their acequias i'm not gonna bad mouth them because i know what it takes to run this system i know what it takes to go through these people's yards when they don't want you in there you know, and their dogs are trying to bite you or they'll even pull guns on you. That happens sometimes on these acequia cleaning. You know, I could see a future like, you know, if you got to run the acequia in five miles of ditch and there's only five or six or 10 of us irrigating, I might go to soil and water in the state and say, hey, let's pipe it because I can't find people to work it. I can't find people to clean it. You know, and uh, and a lot of these people with their second, third home mansions, they don't want us in their property anyways. You know, they fence the south, and uh, and then they then they get all mad when we tell them, hey, we got to bring a crew through your property, you know, or clean the ditch yourself, and then uh, you know, and we still got to maintain it. So. Yeah, you know, when you talk about engineering solutions, you know, that's a double edged sword. Like I say, if I could wave a magic wand, you know, and uh, and I don't have to ma wave a magic wand. I could sense a time when this food system here is going to collapse and everybody who can tolerate the heat and the drought is going to stay here in Taos and work together and grow our food. I'm pretty convinced it can be done, mm -hmm. but not for all these people who are, uh, you know, have a sense of entitlement, convenience, and uh, comfort. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Taos is going to spit them out in about five or 10 years. 
you know, and those of us who are really willing to dig in and call this place home, you know, we'll bring it back from wherever uh, it went. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting when um, in your piece, you, you were talking about creating a multimedia installation around the Horno um, and sort of celebrating the multiculturalism that exists around that object that is emblematic um, of Northern New Mexico. And I wanna know why, uh, what do you think about um, uh, specifically artistic interventions and an artistic sort of exploration of, um, of this, this problem that, that we're facing, you know, climate, climate change and migration of people um, and when the food system does collapse, like why, uh, why educate people through an artistic method? Well, it's another attempt, you know? I mean, I've done the politics. I've done the roundhouse, right? We tried to run this memorial through the, the seed sovereignty mm -hmm. memorial. We tried to run that through the legislature. You know, I was actually taken in the parking garage by the secretary of ag and the, uh, and one of these legislators representative Andy Nunez at the time. And they basically told me, let me tell you how this works, Mr. Santi Stevan. And they schooled me well on how <laughs> politics work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess we could get it done there. You know, that's gonna be tough. The political economic machine, hey, most people don't even understand. They're, you know, they're happy calling this a democracy and done. Mm -hmm. First of all, I say it ain't a democracy, it's a republic. Second of all, you know, it ain't that simple, right? Just like science. They say, oh, do you believe in science? Or not? Oh, you believe in science, done. You know, it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. So, you know, art, art can educate and plus it can uh, motivate, inspire. It can get you at the heart, you know? You'll see certain kinds of art or hear certain kinds of music and you'll start crying, you will. And you probably know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and then, so then you can be educated through your heart. You can be educated through other ways and then you can activate in other ways. How are we gonna activate and save all this? You know, can, do, it does, are the tools in politics, you know, good enough? Are the tools in economics good enough? Are the tools in art good enough? Mm -hmm you know, is a question, but here's the thing with art as opposed to politics. I mean, we can go to politics and we could talk spirituality and religion. You get into art, you can feel spirituality and create religion. You know, I have a feeling that there's an ace in the deck that we don't know is there yet to solve all these problems. The politicians aren't gonna figure out that ace. They're going to be too busy, busy scrambling on to the last of their power and the last of their dollar. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have a feeling with an artistic mind, an artistic heart, and a connection to nature and a connection to each other and what is really real, you know. I'm holding on to a few prophecies and a few teachings I've gotten along the way. You know, the Mayans teach that, uh, that we all agree on this reality right here. We're all dreaming a common dream. We all agree what it is. We all agree we're on this Zoom and we're doing remote education and there's climate change. And this is how, you know, this is how the world works. We all agree on that, right? But we're basically dreaming a collective dream according to Mayan cosmology. And that once we decide to dream a different dream collectively, that we can change this thing and we can make it real. And I, you know, and I'm holding out for that. I think that's possible, you know, and I see what's going on in the media and politics now, and they're just trying to corral us into one way of thinking. How, how could the Mayans come up with a more accurate calendar than we even have today with computers and they be wrong about the nature of reality? that they be wrong about all that you know and i'm not saying they're all right either i'm not saying anybody is all right or all wrong right but i'm just saying you know we're not looking at this thing we can't see the whole thing with art you can see things that aren't real you know that are in the mind and not necessarily reality right mm -hmm. so how is it we're gonna dream a different dream you know politics Petitions, 
you know, uh, signs and marches, maybe, you know, you might see me there, but, uh, Hey, you know, I'm thinking there's a, like I say, there's another card in the deck that we haven't played yet. And, uh, and I think a good way to find that card is to get artistic, get out of our rational mind and, uh, and start being a little more right brained about it and, uh, and getting together you know, not just art as an artist, but as a collective of artists who then are going to come up with crazy ideas. Did you know that an Aztec dance circle is an art offering, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a ceremony, mm -hmm. right? And they do other things that they're not necessarily inviting everybody to, and all that's art. And at some point they figured out not only is this an art, it's ceremony and it's prayer. And as soon as modern art comes through that back door and says, hey, how do we ceremonialize this thing? How do we create prayer? How do we create intention in an artistic way? All right, then. Now I think we'll start fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm holding out for art. Art is, uh, you know, why do they put art and science together? Same side of the coin, right? I went to, I got a degree in biology. It was in the College of Art and Science, right? So the science, everyone goes, do you believe in science or not? Well, <laughs> hey, do you believe in art or not? <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's um, the relationship between the two are often uh, wrongly polarized. In my opinion, I think that they're wrongly polarized. And it uh -huh. seems that there's a... Uh, uh, in order to shift, to be able to shift attitudes, and especially with something like, um, like the acequias, uh that require so much community effort and require uh, the organization of people and people coming together, um, it's, it's sometimes political discourse can get so divisive. But gathering around art and um, and an, for an artistic intention and a ceremonial spiritual intention as well. Um, that seems to be the, the channel to get people to come together. Mm -hmm. um, and Sylvia, I wonder what your thoughts are on this sort of, uh, this relationship between, between exploring, giving educational context or giving context at all around the acequias through the lens of art. I think um, art is absolutely essential. Um, it communicates information that science can exclude. Uh, it's another way of saying what Miguel is saying in some way. We need both rational, uh, you know, scientific discourse as well as the complement, which is non-rational, artistic, ceremonial, ritual forms, because it encodes information that's excluded, I think, uh, from a, a purely linear scientific kind of trajectory. I think science, un science that's unaided by uh, what I'll call non-rational means, including art, ritual, uh, ceremony, uh, other sort of non-rational forms, tends towards ecocide, I believe. Hmm. Uh, so it's like it, it contains information that's absolutely essential to relate us to our ecological setting. You could say that art is fills out the what's absent in a linear uh, perception of the world, and I think that we see that. Uh, with the destruction of the environment and a kind of denial of our connectedness with the natural world and with each other. And so I think the Asakias are important uh, because they contain the seeds for survival in what's going to become a very difficult time. It already is, but it's going to get much more difficult in the coming decades with desertification, with climate change, with fires. and. Uh, the Asekias, like other autonomous farmer organized irrigation systems around the world, are a way for managing the commons on, at a certain scale. And so it's not an interest in their history uh, that motivates me, although I'm certainly interested in their history, or a sort of con you know, preservationist uh, motive. It's, I think that the Asekias really contain uh, a key to the future under what are going to be post-catastrophic conditions. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, and I think that you know the, the effort to continue with the Asakias and to go back to the Asakias and to help them survive is an essential part of 
whether this is going to be a habitable place mm -hmm. in another 50 years or even another 25 years. There's some real choices that are going to have to be made <clears throat> at a policy and political level that I don't think people are ready to do yet. I think that the hand will be forced by conditions that are already spinning out of control. But art is absolutely essential to our humanity and to our relationship to the environment. And um, do you do you see? I wonder if um, if Asakia is also if there's like a symbiotic rela relationship between um, emergence of of rituals and emergence of um, community living and um, and even a more artistic way of living. Um, do you see do you see ritualization emerging from how how we gather around Asakias, how we um, maintain them and use them? Um, is there is there a symbiotic relationship between like our cultural humanity, cultural living, and the the technology of the Asakias? That's a question to both to both of you. Ritual is an essential part of um, of uh, the governance of, of water. Uh, in any system that any kind of a Sekia system around the world, whether you're talking Bali, whether you're talking China, whether you're talking the Andes, uh, where you have these relatively small scale autonomous irrigation systems that are community based systems, um, ritual is an integral part of how they maintain and celebrate and also reaffirm people's connections to each other and to their place. Uh, that th the innovation on a ritual level we see, you know, through what Matt's doing, through Paseo's doing, the, you know, Asekia poetry, Asekia uh, music. Uh, there's uh, a, a lot of people who were using uh, cultural forms to express uh, their connection to the Asekia. So artistic creativity is an emergent process, but it's an integral part of, I think, a system that relates people to their environment in an ongoing, uh, resilient and sustainable manner that's not simply extractive and exploitative. So I think that there's a lot of creativity going on around Asakias uh, on all kinds of levels. I mean, the, the poetry of Olivia Romo would be an example. I mean, there's, you know, the music of David Garcia, uh, you know, composing songs about the Asakia and about cleaning the Asakia. Um, there's an enormous font of creativity I think you know where what's more difficult in a way is what Miguel's saying is the actual physical labor of it, mm -hmm. and that people are less accustomed and inclined towards that. It's a very hard thing. I mean, people left farming because it was so difficult, mm -hmm. and especially in this in this environment, um, you know, it's hard to make a living. And there are a lot of historical and political and economic reasons why it became increasingly difficult. But um, you know, it's it's very it's a very hard thing to do. I mean, we're going to, I think, you know, we're going to, I, I, I won't live to see it, I don't think, you know, but uh, some of you younger people are going, and your children are going to see incredible changes uh, that are already on the horizon, they're already unfolding. And um, physical labor is only one aspect of what's going to be necessary for us to continue to survive. They may, I think that the, the Asakias is a kind of canary in the coal mine mm -hmm. that are sort of casual and unthinking uh, destruction of the Asakias or allowing them uh, to become extinct by thinking of them as a backward, irrational, uh, you know, uh, obstacle to progress uh, that, I'm not, I just, just lost my train of thought there, but um, Well, you got my point. I lost my sentence there, but uh, that they're not, they're an essential form of adaptation to a difficult environment, whether it's one that has an excess of water or a scarcity of water. Um, it's one of the resources that we have, and I don't mean to simply say a resource, but a whole multiplicity of connections that may sustain our ability to, to inhabit this area. I think when the Asakias disappear, if they disappear, and it looks like it's you know, going to be a fight to keep that from happening, not simply as relics, not simply as monuments, because that's an empty 
uh, form in some sense, but as a, as a kind of way of engaging people with their environment. Um, that if they disappear, I think it's a portent of uh, this place becoming uninhabitable by humans. And so, uh, and so this, this acequias and monuments, um, this kind of connection that you make in your, in your piece in the book, um, is it that, and if monuments or, or um, things that are memorializing something that is, um, that has been gone, that is gone, um, should they be, should they be living monuments? Should we think of them as living monuments or should, should we reject the, the, the connection between acequias and monuments? Well, I brought that up in that essay because the whole thing in our political moment uh, where people are talking about monuments and what they stand for, and that's happening here in New Mexico, uh, in Santa Fe, uh, you know, in Albuquerque, uh, in Taos, uh, and also in other parts of the world and in parts of the country, this notion of what, do, what are monuments anyway? Why do people create them and what do they stand for? And if you start looking at, I'm very critical of monuments, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. And I think I start that essay by saying, you know, what kind of a monument would actually represent uh, some values that I think are, you know, would help us to sustain habit habitability of our eco niche, of our region. And so I don't mean to reify them as physical objects and say, oh yes, let's turn them into monuments and that will save them. It's like getting to pe people to think about what values mm -hmm. do we want to represent in some kind of you know, uh, material form. And Asekias, if they're only monuments, they're simply relics to a dead past. Uh, it's like, you know, why do we build statues to soldiers? I mean, why do we build statues to you know, forms of domination of, you know, certainly violent expressions of masculinity, why people at all? And so I've got trying to, in that essay, trying to get think that people, what's worth actually preserving as a living monument? Yes, but not as sort of a, an ossified structure that represents something that's dead and, and that's rooted in the past. But it's, you know, what do we stand for? Mm -hmm. In other words, it's like, there's a lot of talk about what you're against. It's like, what do we stand for? What are you for? Miguel, you've been nodding your head. I, I want to know your thoughts on this, on this relationship between like, between the, the values that the Asekias instill in us. How do we value Asekias? How do we value that, um, all that they represent? Yeah, well, earlier you were talking ritual, you know, mm -hmm. and part of what all that represents, you know, I was thinking, well, what are the rituals? You know, of course, the rituals are sequia cleaning, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we all get together and we all clean our sequias. And, uh, and that's changed in the last two years because of COVID. Right. And it's very uh, interesting how that's changed, you know. But you talk about that ritual of cleaning the sequia, that's to clean the physical sequia channel. So you can have the water flow unobstructed all the way through. You know, and uh, you got to clear out the debris and all this. You sometimes you widen the ditch or take out stuff, and so that's a ritual to maintain the uh, the uh, physical structure of the asequia. And uh, but you know, it's, it's interesting because when I was doing my masters, you know, I interviewed hundreds of people, and I can't wait to get back into my notebooks and my recordings, man. When I retire, if I can, I'll do all that. And I, I got I got oro oro de barrio in in all my works. But one time I interviewed this lady from here in Canyon and uh, this viejita and she told me, she said, Sabes que mijito, do you know why it's so dry these years? She was all back in the day when it would be dry. We would all gather the mayordomos of the church, not the sequia. We have other mayordomos too, right? The mayordomos of the church would go to the capilla and ring the bell and we would all go over there and we would we would pray and we would take the santos out of the capilla and we would go down all the acequia. We would start at the presa and we would walk down the acequias and we would sing to Mary and we would pray and, and we would go all the acequias and then we would take the santos back to the church and we would have our prayer. And you know what, mijito? That's why we're suffering drought. And I said, orale, you know, what's up with prayer you know what i mean and what's up with people getting together to pray 
And I'm not talking church where one man is telling you that you're a sinner and you know you better pay up. I'm talking about people getting together who believe and who want for a reason. And uh, there's the ritual on check this out. So I'm doing my research, right? Looking at the history I got, and I wish I would have thought of it before I could have been prepared. I got tree ring data over the last 2000 years. You look at this tree ring data, I'll analyze this tree ring data for you. In fact, again, if I could clone myself, I've been talking to a statistician. I'm looking for the raw data so we can do statistics on this. I'm gonna prove this in the future when I get the raw data. He told me that's all I got to do. And when I have time, I'm going to do it. But uh, you look at this tree ring data over the last 2,500 years. Okay. And I'll analyze this tree ring data qualitatively. I'm going to analyze it quantitatively. But if you look at the tree ring data, man, you look at the environment over the last 2,500 years, as soon as the Pueblos got corn and settled down, the climate settled down. Right. And then, then it, so you have this swing in, you know, over a thousand years, climate, drought, feast or famine, then the Pueblo settled down, ritual, you see that whole cycle tighten, I swear, it's right there, data, mm. you see the cycle tighten, then you look at the place about 1600, when Juan de Oñate came, and, and, push the Pueblos to be Catholic and the bottom dropped out on our climate. Mm. That's why there was a Pueblo revolt. People starved in the 1600s. I'm using that as proof or, you know, at least suggestion that ritual, prayer, ceremony moderates the climate. And it goes back to what I was saying about the Mayans in the dream. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you know, I appreciate the view of when you're saying, hey, I don't know, this place could be habitable in 50, 20 years or what it's going to look like. And, you know, if you look at it that way in the linear academic, hist you know, historical format, which Western society has trained us to think, it's pretty grim, especially if you're out here like me, seeing how it actually is changing and how the animals are changing, how the soils are changing, how everything's changing, pretty grim. But then again, I think of that viejita going to the capilla and taking out with the whole community, taking out that. I think about, you know, what the Pueblo Indians are still doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I go, hey, what about the rest of us? What if we all get together? The good heart, clear mind, make an offering, do a prayer, you know, make some sacrifice and i'm not talking killing chickens or goats like they did in the bible but you know sacrifice hey what is it i don't know sleep deprivation fasting you know hey show the spirit inside that you're serious about this and if we do that collectively you know this is a conversation my wife and i are having at the dinner table how are we going to do this so it's going to happen we're going to get together and start praying people we're going to remember that we're, with that we're spirits inside a human body, not human having a spiritual experience. And that, you know, we have a lot more power than we do. And, I, and yeah, we're being pushed up against the wall. And as soon as we're pushed up against the wall, then we're going to find that ace. Mm -hmm. And we're going to change this thing. And no, it's not going to go linear. I, I, that's what I want to believe. If it goes linear, A, then let's talk about it in a different way. I'll solve all these problems using linear science using crop diversity using an understanding of you know everything scientific that i do wearing that hat but that's not what i'm holding out for if i got to play that way i'll play that way I'll, and i'll tell you you want i'll entertain every idea i'll solve every single problem scientifically i've been consumed with this for 35 years ever since i heard air raid sirens in los alamos you know testing bombs so I've been thinking about this a long time. I dare you to ask me a question that I haven't solved using science. All the solutions are here. But, you know, that's the good news. The better news is, is I think we got something else that we don't even know we have yet to solve all these problems. Mm -hmm. I don't Would know if that answered the question. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does answer the question because it's, it, well, it, to me, because it's, um, the solution seems to be, something that comes out of 
the gathering together, that having the ceremony, the participation, the collective participation, and um, and you know whether that collective participation, how how it looks, and the the sort of texture that it takes um, will change over the over the years, the decades, and centuries. Um, and and as Sil Sylvia, as you said uh, about um, you know with like the festivals, like the Paseo Festival, is is a new a sort of new form of like collective gathering, a new form of ceremony. And as people find, continue to, to innovate new ways to come together um, and do that alongside of the physical labor that is required to, to keep these, um, like cleaning out the ditches um, and maintaining them and picking up a shovel and actually just doing the physical, the physical labor. There is, there is a sort of like the pairing of the two things of, of um, coming together around for an artistic purpose and for artistic expression and uh, um, artistic understanding plus the physical labor, that seems to be the ritual that from there you find these solutions, you find these spiritual solutions um, is, is sort of my take. The other thing that I wanna, that I, I would, a question for both of you that I'm thinking about a lot is that um, there are, again, as people, I'm so interested in this, um, influx of people coming into New Mexico um, are, because of, you know, because of, of changing times, people often romanticize out here. People romanticize the West, they want to come out here. Um, but there are a lot of people just, especially on the coastal parts of the country, they have a different understanding of water, a totally different relationship and conceptualization of water. Um, some people, from the East Coast, fear water. You know, you think about Hurricane Sandy, a natural disaster um, several years ago, where people are thinking how to keep the water out. Um, and so I'm trying to understand, like, how do you communicate? Um, what do, what do the Asakias communicate to people who are who have grown up in such different contexts, such different relationships to water? Well, I think that coming, I think the mindset or the mindsets that arise out of arid environments uh, where water is the limiting factor is different from wet climates, humid climates, where an excess of water is the issue. So different kinds of worldviews, I think, emerge in those different kinds of settings for the management of water. Uh, you, I mean, we've talked about ritual and we've talked about the labor of the Asekia, but there's also this dimension, I think, of political awareness that's necessary. Uh, people have come to New Mexico for about 150 years now uh, as a way of escaping from other parts of the world other part, you know, from the, the more urban areas. The land of enchantment is a land of fantasy. And I think what we're about to see uh, as a result of the pandemic, and we're already seeing it, is a massive influx of people who are leaving the cities. I mean, right now, there's a real estate boom. There is a construction boom that is enormous. There is a shifting uh, that's taking place with respect to housing. Uh, both Taos and Santa Fe, for example, are faced with a situation in which people have second homes that they rent out. They have mm -hmm. virtually no commitment to uh, this place other than as a cash cow and as a sort of romantic escape. Uh, people who are discovering that they can work from home are leaving the cities and buying up places in Taos and Santa Fe uh, and other parts of New Mexico thinking, well, I can work here and get away from all of that. Uh, so issues of policy, I think, and planning are essential and some very difficult choices are facing people who are you know, in positions of making those decisions. And it's like, we can pray, we can dance, we can have ritual, we can irrigate, but there's also a political dimension to this and an economic dimension to this that's on a more macro scale. And I think that's where a lot of the difficulty is going to arise. Um, people move here uh, if you come from east of the 100th meridian, you have no conception of what water scarcity is about. It's a different world. 
people imagine the West as a place of freedom and individuation. Um, people who move here have no conception of scarcity of water because they've grown up, many of them, in a place where the water is just a tap that you turn on that comes out of the wall. Um, we have here communities that are like other parts of the world where people are actually in direct contact with the source of their water and they mm -hmm. manage it. Uh, even the mutual domestics, I mean, people are managing their own water and governing it at enormous expense, both of labor uh, and increasingly economically. Uh, and that's an enormous responsibility, but it's one that people who grew up in an urban environment have no conception of. And we still have it here. So, um, you know, the, uh, I mean, what was your original question here? It's like- um, Just thinking about how, how the acequias, um, how would you even approach, how could someone from an urban area that, ha that has an abundance of water, how would they uh, come to understand acequias and could they ever, um, like, how do they become invested? Well, I think that, first of all, if you're lucky enough uh, and wealthy enough to buy a piece of land that has water rights and that's on a ditch, um, that a, le a level of education and awareness is so necessary to think of it as if, if you're all you're interested in money, then the thing to do is to sell your water rights separately and then use the land for development and take it out of the ground, take the water out of the ground. Um, so. I think people who actually happen to buy a piece of land with water rights should uh, educate themselves and be educated to realize what an extraordinary privilege they have access to, to actually belong to an organization that collectively manages the commons through a process of mutual trust, reciprocity, and mutualism. This is an extremely important thing. Um, I think also it's like very a lot of people who even now, I guess, grow up in certain parts of Taos and who move here have no conception of what the topography and the physiography of the land is. Um, I was teaching a class just yesterday and some young woman said, who obviously does not come from New Mexico, but is intrigued by the acequias and is an environmentalist and is, uh, you know, concerned and interested about uh, how one can become involved with acequias. And I think, well, study the landscape. Find out where your water's coming from. What kind of what watershed do you happen to be in? Uh, knowing your watershed. I mean, everybody is located in relationship to some kind of a watershed. If you're in the east or in an urban area, the concept of watershed is meaningless. Here in the west, the watershed is visible. It's present, and you it, because the land is so barren or comparatively barren, you see the bones of the earth, and you see what the hydrology is. Learn what the hydrology of your neighborhood is. You know, learn what kind of an environment you're living in. I mean, people who grow up in cities, through no fault of their own, have no conception mm -hmm. of their relationship to a to a physical natural environment. And many people who come to Taos, I mean, maybe they ski. Uh, or go for walks or ride their bikes, but they have no sense of where the water flows or why or when. And so I think a certain kind of intensifying your awareness of what your setting is and, and what your relationship is to the sources of water is an extremely important exercise for people to undergo. Uh, and so the, the, the kind of ignorance that people bring to their setting is something that needs to be remedied. Mm -hmm. I think through a multiplicity of, of educational means. I mean, certainly science, art, you know, just, you know, teaching kids uh, about growing things and about watering things and about animals in place. I mean, understanding your place, uh, not as a place where you simply go to escape or use to make money, but as a place where you actually have a certain uh, responsibility and obligation to become aware of. Uh, and to even a very urban person, I think, can have uh, awakened in them some kind of engagement with their environment that becomes custodial, that becomes responsible, and becomes re reciprocal. I mean, our whole economic philosophy is completely warped and cuts us off from our environment in ways that are simply ecocidal. Miguel, I'm, I'm interested to hear your take on, um, on people coming from a water abundant landscape to an arid an arid dry climate and how do you 
how do people become invested in, in acequias who have no conception of drought and, and dryness? It's tough. It's tough, you know. I don't know how you're going to teach that. You know, I think climate change and drought is going to be the best teacher of that. You know, I got a new neighbor here from North Carolina, you know, this guy put in a well and he was running the sprinkler 24 seven. I tried reporting him. I tried talking to him. Finally, I got through to him and he turned it off. But this is a guy who's aware, right? He's mm -hmm. like one of these hippie types. He's a, you know, environmentalist, he'll call himself, you know, and he's running the water. He might even be running the water now. He just took off the sprinkler. He has it on a solar panel. And, you know, so how are we going to learn these things? It's important to note that when the acequias were dug, they were also your domestic water. So when you went to go cook your beans or to drink or to bathe, you sent your child either to the acequia or to the river to bring water. Okay. That was our relationship with water. We had to keep that water clean because not only was it the river, was it the acequias, it was our drinking. That was our relationship to it. How are you going to reteach that? Even the youth of today and the local Tausenos that I work with have no concept of that. And they grew up their whole life with the faucet. Okay. So even local people need to be educated. I got a guy over here putting his washing machine in the acequia. We got another guy over here running his septic straight into the river. They're local people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they need to be educated too. There's just way too much convenience and people don't know about it. Water was so important. We would dig our own wells. We would dig wells 60, 80. I found a 90 foot dug well that was lined with cedar planks that were cut with an ax. So that's how important water was. And now you turn on the faucet and you think you're entitled to it. How are you going to teach that? Books? videos no you know how you're going to teach that thirst that's how you're going to teach that and you know let's talk about who's the greatest teacher around okay if you people want to talk mother earth okay everyone talking mother earth as it's some kind of abstract concept yo is the earth your mother or not if she's your mother yeah teach you you better learn and if you don't learn yeah spanking here it comes. And you know, if you're that kind of kid, you're going to go cry to the cops, child abuse. Or you're going to say, you know what? I blew it. I'm sorry, mom. What do I do now? How do I fix it? You know, so I don't know what, what's everyone's relationship with water. Okay. Where in permaculture, you got to have all your elements taken care of, all your functions taken care of by three things. Okay, where's your water coming from? If it's coming from the top, you're deficient. You know, mm. you don't know where your water's coming from. If you're gathering it from the roof, okay, now you're paying attention to the rain. Now you know for every thousand square feet of roof I got, I'm going to collect, you know, 700 gallons of water for every inch of rain. You know, if you got your acequia, okay, if you got your well that you're maintaining, but you know, what's our real relationship with water? How are you going to teach that when everybody in the world taking it for granted? And like Dr. Rodriguez says, now these people are looking at it as water rights, acre feet. What a joke that the state engineer trying to tell me that I have what? 2.5 acre feet per acre of water rights. Psh, I dare him to show me that water. You know, he owes me water. If he's going to throw those numbers around, I want the state engineer water truck driving up my road because he owes me water. Oh, but he's not in the business of giving water. He's in the business of taking water, right? Because that's a colonial force that's still in play. And uh, can we teach it in time? You know, I always hear uh, Dr. Rodriguez saying, you know, it's not going to happen on my watch. Yo, while all of us looking at COVID and, see, and seeing, hey, are you vaccinated or not? Yo, look outside. It's dry. It's windy. The acequia barely flowed today. I'm not going to have it a month. The river's dry. Yo, what happens when this upper watershed catches on fire? 
You know, I don't want to put bets on it, but I could bet it's going to happen this year, right? And if they don't put it out, then it's going to be a burnt watershed. And if they put it out, then they're going to put it out with ammonia, nitrate, and cyanide, which is going to end up in our water. So, hey, we got some serious problems. And, uh, and yeah, how are we going to take it on? I mean, I've tried addressing this with policy. I've tried addressing this with art. You know, and when it comes down to it, I'm the only crazy vato I know growing lentils, right? <laughs> Who grows lentils? Only an idiot would grow lentils. You can buy lentils for 50 cents a pound. Yo, do you got lentils that are adapted to cows to drought? Did you know that lentils are the strongest crop in the world? Frost tolerant and drought tolerant? Garbanzos are next. Are you growing garbanzos? You know, who's going to give you lentils and garbanzos? when there's no water to grow anything. The Arabs are growing garbanzos and lentils without any water, right? So, you know, hey, at some point we just got to take care of this ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's where I'm at, you know, and, uh, and just trying my best at it, you know, trying to keep everything alive. A Noah's Ark kind of concept. What are you keeping alive? Mm -hmm. You know, what's depending on you? You know, I got all kinds of pollinators depending on me. I'm spreading kota around. I'm doing all kinds of things for the pollinators. I'm building habitat for birds. You know, Noah's art. You know, get all these species living. Get them to the other side of whatever is coming next. You know, get yourself to the other side. You know, how are we going to educate each other? Psh, I don't know. But life's a good uh, educational process. It looks like life's getting pretty heavy duty about now. <laughs> yeah giving some heavy duty lessons right about now um i will uh turn it over and just allow allow some time to open up to the rest of our of our audience for a, a question and answer um pretty early on shane asked in the chat um and i'll just read it aloud for for both of you um could you speak to the risks the risks of the renewed interest in acequias leading to a gentrification of the acequias? And what does it mean to save them if it means a displacement of the people of the culture that created the acequias? Yeah, it's tough. You well, know, it's I, not, it's yeah, not re renaissance of the acequias that's displacing people. It's, um, you know, larger forces that are displacing people. I mean, this displacement has been going on for a century. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, the gentrification of the Asakias is certainly a, a danger. When the town first talked about restoring Asakias, uh, you know, in, in the park, and I was very skeptical. I thought, what, what's the point of, uh, you know, restoring these Asakias for tourism? Uh, I've come to appreciate the town's efforts to restore and to get water running in the Asakias. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. It doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it will restore agriculture, but without the regeneration of agriculture in a new era won't happen without the Asakias, uh, at least to some degree. Uh, we're caught in a real double bind here because we can't, I mean, gentrification is a poisonous process. Uh, it's not the restoration of the Asekias that's driving it. Uh, it's larger forces that are driving it. And that includes policy. That includes housing policy. That includes, uh, you know, uh, econ I mean, one of the great issues here in Northern New Mexico as in other of the very poor parts of the country is having a, a a sustainable economy. We in fact don't. It's tourism and government uh, that are the economic basis. And to restore agriculture uh, at a scale that would be sustainable and resilient and actually um, feed people is a very tall order, but I don't think we're going to survive without that. And the ways to do that are, are complex and involve a tremendous amount of commitment. But without that, uh, this place is just going to be a barren desert in another 
40 years. I mean, our chances of survival and of thriving are, you know, diminishing every day, but that doesn't mean that we should give up. I mean, one of the things I admire about farmers is that they're incredibly practical, but they also know they're not in charge. Mm -hmm. That there are larger forces to which they're subject, and there's a kind of wisdom in that, uh, mm -hmm. that is, you know, complements this linear notion that you can simply control things. Uh, with, a, with a kind of scientific and technological manipulation. That's what's gotten us into trouble. Uh, I think that there's a lot of creativity and energy uh, that uh, exists in people of all different ages and that we do have the seeds uh, for at least a chance at survival here. Yeah, and you know, there's two kinds of interest in the Asekia, at least, right? One of the interests is, uh, you know, maybe it's gentrification, but I could tell you, I got some new neighbors over here that they blend right in, you know. In fact, our community, our Asekia system's better now that they're here. Why? Because they bought this little house over here, and then they, you know, this this little Asekia Cita, the Lindero, the lateral ditch that took it to their property was erased. They went out there with a pick and shovel and they opened it mm. and they got into all kinds of hassles with the neighbors. They had to figure out how to run it around, but man, they were committed and they got the Asekia to their property and they're doing a garden and they planted trees. So do you call that gentrification? You know, those people aren't from here, but you know, at the end of the day, they're making our, our system stronger because they're participating. Okay. Now there's a couple other people moved into town over here. You know, and what's their deal? You know, they don't do any work themselves. They hire other people and a lot of people to do all the work for them. The other people I was talking about, they dug the ditch themselves. And uh, and what's their interest in the Asekia is, you know, there was a this guy over here. There was a guy over here. He restored like five acres, you know, and I was singing praises to this guy, man, because it was desert. And he turned it into alfalfa and hay mix. Beautiful, green. He put in new compuertas. He put, all at his own expense. I was just like, yeah, this guy's awesome. But then he was overheard at a party after a few drinks. And he said, you know, through the Mitote Networks, of course, <laughs> local news channel, you know, and he said, hey, I came to the realization that investing in Wall Street is just too volatile. You don't know what the market's going to do. It depends on who's in charge in the, in the office. You know, if you want a solid investment, a really solid investment, it's in water in the Southwest and here in New Mexico. He's all, look at me. I got all this land here and now I reestablish those water rights. Man, that's going to be a solid investment. Now I'm working on my next one. So at first I thought this guy was restoring all his land so it could be green and Asekia water rights connected to the land. But you know what? He doesn't look at it that way. You know, this other couple that I'm talking about, how do they look at it? They look at it, you know, we're talking about grafting our pear trees and apple trees and what kind of apples do you think? And hey, what seeds can, do you have any seeds? And you know, hey, what are you growing? What, what are you growing now? That's their interest, but this other guy, Everything looks nice and green. And then that's another thing about your question. What happens with all this renewed interest? What if all kinds of people move in here and then they want the Asekia water, right? Well, guess what? We don't have it. We don't have enough. If every one of our members here was irrigating, if every piece of land wanted water, you know, and that's the problem what happened in Arroyo Seco with all these people challenging the Abeta water settlement over there is you know that used to be like very large intact pieces of land a few families making decisions of where the water goes now in our royal seco everybody has their little lots and they all think that because they have water rights they're entitled to the water well it's not that simple so you know what's your interest of the water what's your relationship to it what's the concept of what water is all those questions need to be answered before I can answer if that particular person is going to be part of the problem or part of the solution of a renewed interest in Asekia's, you know, 
in this day and age. Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you guys see if there is a realistic, um, I mean, if, if the, uh, you know, the strength of the Asekias is in some ways that strength of neighborly uh, understanding or at least the basis for the negotiation of the social in that way, right? That concept of the Asekias being that first form of government that wasn't Native American on in the continent, the resilience of that uh, local governing structure, right? And you just pointed out those examples of why gentrification is so pernicious, right? This guy that's looking at the long-term investment strategy he made, about the culture or the continuity, as opposed to your good neighbors, which are, yeah, they're not from here, but they are buying into the community on a, let's call it a spiritual level even. I'll, I'll go there and be bold enough to say that. So, you know, all of this is falling apart because people can go and, and buy water rights and then sell them on an exchange, right? And ship it all to Texas or whatever they're going to do. Or, or uh, be really terrible neighbors, like the ones that don't even understand when they bought and on an Asekia that you had to allow people through there, there was a right of way. And so now they're pulling guns or they're simply want to build their third vacation home and not know what it is or whatever, right? I was at Olympia the other day where in the process of the cleaning, we found out that neighbors who had started to run some kind of tourist thing had placed cameras along the Asekia so they could see who's coming in. It wasn't even on their property, right? They wanted to know who was going up the Asekia. Uh, and uh, they didn't have permission to put the cameras, but they did it anyway. Anyway, I guess just to elaborate on my question, is that right? Is there a way with the renewed interest and in all of these uh, opportunity slash uh, dangers that could happen of a way for the community to regulate uh, and like, uh, this is obviously unrealistic under capitalism, but literally the right of an Asekia to say, we, you don't get to buy that land because your intentions are going to destroy this community or erode the integrity of its community. And I guess that's kind of where I was going with my question. If either of you want to elaborate on that, and then I'll go back to being quiet and uh, a spectator and uh, let the. Well, you know, the Asekias have the ability to block a transfer, right? You know, that was a state law that was passed. And, uh, and it's interesting how that's being challenged. You know, um, I don't know the end result, but I remember there was a guy in here who said, hey, uh, back in the day, he was like, you know, they tried to trans block a transfer and then he threatened a lawsuit. And he said, you know, I better get my water that's supposed to be transferred to me or, or tell every Asekia that if I find water on their Asekia, I'm gonna sue them too. And I'm gonna run you all through the courts. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's tough, all this, um, this renewed interest, you know, I don't know where it's going, you know, and, um, I, and really, at the end of the day, I don't know, it's bad news, but the good news is, is, you know, at some point, everybody's going to start fighting over the water, and there's going to be no water, <laughs> and then that's going to force us to work together on a whole nother level of uh of working together and you know and finding common interest which is brass tax common interest and so that's going to be the silver lining of this cloud you know and uh, it's going to take some time to get there maybe you know but like i say this year could be it you know the water levels are dropping heavy right now and uh i've never seen it this dry and uh you know, there's already two fires in the Gila, you know, and, you know, and yeah, so if it gets tough, you know, I have a feeling people will band together and people wherever they're at are going to realize that it's important for them to work with their neighbors and, you know, and we're all in this together. And that's the hardest lesson that's going to be learned, especially by those who, you know, would consider themselves financially elite or privileged or entitled, or, or maybe they don't consider themselves that. They think that's normal. And, uh, but they're the ones that are going to have to snap that they also, you know, have to belong to a community. They have to belong to a, a place and, and money isn't going to save them anymore. 
I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I struggle with that one myself because it actually, literally, it comes up my road every day, almost. I got people driving up my road and doing all, shh, spocking me. I ask, I'm out in my fields. They're asking me, oh, would you ever think of selling your land? Is that house in front of yours? Would you think of selling it? And I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah, $5 million <laughs> cash right now. Or there's the road, you know, maybe I'll get my $5 million. Then I'll go buy some land with water rights on Aseca and I don't know, Mora. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> Someone say a joke. <laughs> uh, good question though man that's the one that's the that's the linchpin question right there that we're struggling with that's it you know what that's the you know, that's the grill of the question yeah, yeah. i don't know if i answered it but one of the beauties of the Ezekiel system is that it is an open system but it's also one of the great dangers i mean mm -hmm. you can be, you can buy into it and you can become a responsible uh, and contributing parciante. And every ditch has seen that. I've seen that on my ditch that people have come in and they've become an important part of the acequia. And maybe they don't speak Spanish and maybe they don't, they didn't grow up here and they didn't grow up farming. But if they uh, honor the acequia and they follow the rules and they use the water and they respect it, then uh, they're part of the acequia. And it's one of the few ways I think to overcome the profound segregation that prevails in Taos. I mean, there are very few ways that you can cross the lines of segregation here in Taos. And I think one of them could be the acequia. But on the other hand, you have anybody with money can get in there and do what they want. And we don't have, um, I don't think we have uh, ways of, any obvious ways of keeping that from happening that still are, you know, basically democratic. It's a great danger, money rules. Yeah. You know, I live in the Hondo watershed. I mean, look what we have upstream. I'll ski down. Yeah, we have a, a, a hedge fund billionaire who is expanding, a, you know, with uh, Vale and Aspen and year round recreational uh, activities and basically deep pockets, uh, an international consortium. And you have downstream people who are worried sick about the water quality and the water quantity, uh, about secondary development, about real estate development, about people moving in with incredible amounts of money uh, and the tax base rising. And so we're facing every, every watershed in the Taos Basin is has shared problems, but has its own particular issues that it's facing. Uh, and part of that it has to do with who owns the, you know, the upper watershed and in every case, it's the federal government controls. I mean, even for Taos Pueblo, I mean, in trust, you know, Taos Pueblo's land and water is held in trust by the federal government. You know, so there are enormous issues about ownership and power uh, that are, you know, affecting. Uh, I think people need to think of Taos as a, as a set of watersheds that are interconnected uh, and each has its own issues, just as each ditch has its own issues. And to study that and understand it, but you know, there the questions of power and money prevail everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I guess on the one hand, I'd say Miguel, well, at least you know this rich guy next door, at least he's irrigating, at least he's restoring the land for the wrong reasons. But it's better than letting it go completely dry. But it's true, there's less water now, and I mean, there's more water that's available because fewer people are farming. But if everybody on the ditch was farming, then it would be even more scarce. So it's, you know, it's, we're between a rock and a hard place on this one. Yeah, what I'm hoping is like, if there was a, a food system or an economic collapse that that dude would actually be here and then I could turn all of the alfalfa into a cornfield. <laughs> you know because yeah it could come down to wherever you're at is where you're gonna have to figure it out and then you got to decide where you're at and maybe that's why a lot of people want to come here you know to Taos because you know they know that if anybody knows how to survive in harsh conditions it's it's the OG Taos Enos and uh and that's maybe that's what they want 
you know, maybe that's why they're all coming over here because they're like, you know what, if it goes down, I don't want to be in Texas. I don't want to be in North Carolina. You know, I want to be close to the Indians and the Azequias. <laughs> you know, but unfortunately, like Shane said, you know, if there's too many, then what's left? But again, you know, getting back to my faith and all this, you know, hey, any of you read the Bible, man, I think if things get bad enough and we pray hard enough from it, man, mana will fight, fall from the sky. I'm just saying. <laughs> I want to um, sort of wrap up with a final question that was actually written in to us um, uh, earlier today or maybe about a day ago and uh, I think it would be an, an interesting way to end this um, so I'll read the question at what point do do you two Sylvia Miguel at what point do you two feel that it's important that the laws in regards to acequias that are currently in place be adhered to by all, including the office of the state engineer, rather than make them up as, as fits the narrative. For example, there are entities that claim surface water rights when in fact their water rights are underground, but because of some grants made available and the, the need for money needed for the acequias, um, acequia officials are willing to bend the rules to accommodate, to accommodate um, or they're willing to lease water and commu to community gardens um, while at the same time causing inequities in water usage and sharing. So I guess this question is getting at the balance between, um, between acequia officials and policymakers um, bending the rules for community gardens or community spaces, but really thinking that they're solving a problem, but really causing more inequities. I'm not sure if I follow the logic of that. Maybe you could have a clearer statement of that. I'm not sure what's being described there. I mean, bending the rules, run, I don't know if you caught that, Miguel. I'm not sure. Yeah, this is the way I see it, okay? As first of all, the laws are clear, okay? So if the laws are being broken, the laws should be applied. Why do the acequias of Gainas over there by the city of Las Vegas why do they need to get a water master to solve that? The law is clear. Priority administration. The acequias of Gaina get the water first and the city of Las Vegas gets it second. It's in black and white. It's written into the law. But instead of saying, yeah, we have the law. It's clear. Let's follow the law. Sorry, Las Vegas. You got to defer to the acequias. They're going to let you know when you can fill up your lake. Mm -hmm. that's not how it went they needed to get a water master they had to pay for it city of las vegas was like cool we can afford that forty-five thousand a year big deal but the acequias also had to put up forty-five thousand a year to pay the water master ninety thousand so in that case the law eight hey, why do you even have a law if then you got to get lawyers and all these water masters and all this stuff you know you the judge should have just applied the law done but yeah, the laws aren't for justice, right. right? The laws have another purpose, you know, mm -hmm. make money in a capitalist system or, you know, create guardrails for people not to move in on other people's property. I don't know. You know, that's a, that's a bigger philosophical question. But in that one sense, the laws are clear and mm -hmm. they should have benefited the Asekias and they didn't. But all of this law is built on the Territorial Water Code of 1907 which says your water right is separate from your land right. Mm. Okay, well, if I had a magic wand and could get rid of the, the stupidest law in the land, it would be all of these laws that define natural resources as property rights, right? They, no, the water belongs to the land. No, the minerals belong under the land as part of the land that they're part of. And if a person lives there and doesn't want their land dug up for coal or gold or whatever, then no. I don't care about your property rights. So, you know, on the one hand, the law is clear and should be applied when, you know, when there's justice involved and the acequias are like, hey, priority administration, that should benefit the Pueblos. And that should benefit the acequias. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. That's what you're talking about, bending the laws. 
But you look at the foundation that all of these laws are built on, territorial water code that separates the property right, water right property from the land right, that just doesn't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. And the only thing that the, the only if if we're gonna if we're gonna allow this legal system to continue the way it is, we're gonna be buying air next, right? right. You're gonna be buying oxygen. You're gonna be, you know, having a an oxygen tank delivery system and paying for it because they've monetized everything and they made it legal. And you know, and there's no other way to slice it. It's stupid. It's reckless. It's mm -hmm. unsustainable. And if we're going to adhere to the laws on the one K on the one hand, let's adhere to them, right? Mm -hmm. If it's illegal, it's illegal. And then on the other hand, you know, if these laws are built on, on sketchy foundations that don't really honor, you know, other people's values, right? And that's what we're having now is a crisis of values is everybody wants to value Western science, Western politics, you know, and then everybody else's value, psh, forget you. You know, we don't believe you. You're not making anybody any money. So, you know, I don't know. When it comes to all those laws, hey, what about natural law? You know, we need a provision for that. And if it's not going to be natural law, then, hey, there's a thing called oh, good old-fashioned common sense. But there, I'm, maybe I'm speaking like one of these farmers, right, who defers to a larger, <laughs> larger force. <laughs> Yeah, there is such a thing as common sense. <laughs> yeah, waters. Yeah, I think a, I think a rephrasing, maybe a rephrasing of the question, or a, more of a generalization would be: wh where do you draw the line? Where do you adhere to laws and policy, and where do you? break them and what sort of like how do you how do you define i think the question is asking like how do you define when you when you um respect a law and when do you break it and and sort of that kind of like moral um not even a moral question but um just a, a question of evaluating policy i think the question has to do with that well i think each case has to be taken uh individually because i mean you can't answer a question like that in general it seems to me yeah. it's a particular circumstance i mean miguel invokes the case of las vegas in that um you know it's it i mean it's like well, yeah when do you stand up against a law that's unjust uh, you know it depends on the conditions and the circumstance you know i you can't really i mean i would hesitate to to, to give a blanket response to that because mm -hmm. it depends on the conditions mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, this year they were telling us, hey, please, all you smart, small farmers, don't irrigate this year. Don't do your farming. We're going to need all the water, you know, south of Elephant Butte, right? That was a message we were getting. Okay, you know, I would argue my irrigating up here actually creates more water down there through infiltration, seepage, and upwelling later. But uh, what if that were to become law? What if they were to say, we're going to make it illegal, for all of you Zasekias to divert water, you know, what if they were to do that? You know, are we going to adhere to that? You know, maybe here in Taos we would, because, you know, we're already, you know, we're already, you know, who we are. But, you know, if you went to a place like Mora or, you know, certain areas in Penasco and you tried a lot like that, it's not going to fly. You'd be the state engineer to be putting himself in danger going out in those mountains and try and enforce that law. So, you know, I, we haven't been pushed up against the wall yet, you know, but for what we've seen with these court cases and how the laws applied, the laws, the laws applied to benefit the elite, you know, everybody has this romantic vision of, uh, of uh, you know this country and how it is, but but most of those people who have that vision, and I say most because I know a lot of a uh, of my own too, but usually they rode in on the coattail of colonization, mm -hmm. you know, and they have this idea that everything's just and equal and founding fathers and uh, declaration of independence and all that, and you know, and it kind of blows their mind that there uh, there's actually a lot of injustice and a lot of oppression at the hands of the uh, political and economic system that they subscribe to and value, 
as something that should be just and should be, you know, based on equality. And, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, watch the news. It isn't, it isn't for a lot of people, you know, people of color, uh, you know, within, uh, in, within a, a lower economic strata, you know, the laws aren't applied equally. And, and how is that learned? I don't know. Well, I so appreciate um, all of this, all of what was unpacked tonight and the, the nuance involved in managing the acequias and, um, and understanding their, again, their vital, uh, not just a, a material life resource, but a cultural and spiritual life resource as well. Um, and thank you, Sylvia and Miguel, um, endlessly for being so generous with your insight and generous with um, with all of these layers and going through all of these layers of complexity with us. And thank you, Matt and the Paseo Project. Um, it's been a pleasure to host this, uh, this program series and um, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the, the discussion tonight and um, you can reference all of the resources that were linked in the chat and I appreciate it so much that you tuned in. Thanks everyone. Thanks Miguel and Sylvia. Thank you, uh, Bethany. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>